right. What a great intro. Great to be here, folks. I'm Rob Tatro from robtatro.com, portfolio manager here at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management and at the Tatro Wealth Advisor Group. Thanks for joining us today. Really excited about our guest. Bring him in right away here. But before we do that, no, you know what? I want to bring him right away. We just saw the disclaimer. Uh, we'll bring in our guest right away. Today, we have none other than Scott Chan. Scott, let me bring you in here right away. There we go. Scott Chan, MBA, CFA, Managing Director, Equity Research, Financial, specifically stocks, the guy who here at Can Accord Genuity focuses his research, his livelihood on studying the financial companies and a couple others that some wouldn't consider financials, perhaps at some other firms, but we are thrilled and lucky to have you here, Scott. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Rob, for having me. Appreciate it. Okay, so let's get into specifically Canadian banks. Let's start with that today. We're going to talk about Canadian banks. We're going to talk about US banks. We're going to talk about some names that you like, some, some stories that that you want to touch on. You're going to report to us on People's Corp as well and uh, anything else that you're watching. So I'll pull up a chart here. This is the portfolio mix at Q2 uh, for 2020 for the, the, the six big banks. Okay, I'm going to pull this up and then you can, I mean, you, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see the numbers, but regardless, it shows at the bottom, RBC, BMO, National, TD, BNS, and Commerce. And uh, uh, it's broken down into their exposure, governments versus mortgages and, and a few other ones. But the striking, the, when I saw this chart for the first time, the striking uh, for me was the big number of BMO that has government business and then the strong presence for commerce and Royal in residential mortgages. But you're going to tell me there's more to this chart than just that. Yeah, there is. And, and, and that's where the first piece where, where investors really look to is, is where, where, where where are the hotspots of these big six banks and where are the differentials? And as you pointed out, Royal Bank and CIBC have the largest residential mortgage exposure in their books and, and in Canada as well. Both of them actually have higher exposure in Alberta, which we talked about as well. And, and that's a hot spot as we alluded to. And, and both are very aggressive in that Quebec market. So they're very aggressive underwriting. CIBC did pause a little bit over the last two, three years, and that's kind of stalled loan growth, but they're on that path to really get back and be really competitive and, and to really grow that book. You mentioned the government side, which includes commercial and business, and BMO by far stands out as the one bank that focuses on that business, not only in Canada, but in the U.S. market. And we can talk about U.S. banks afterwards. All the other banks rel have relatively simple market shares on the commercial side, but BMO focuses on it more, even on the small, mid side, which, which is a bit more risk right now during this pandemic. And the last thing to point out on that chart is credit cards. And, and credit cards is a great business when the economy is working well. Uh, when it's not working well, like we've seen in the past three, four months, people aren't using their credit cards. So there's less fees. Uh, the loan books, the loan books have shrunk. So um, you know, the margins are, are getting hit from that perspective as well. And when the first thing on credit hits, Rob, it does come in delinquencies on credit cards. Right. Uh, so that's very, very watchful. So it's a very, very high, you know, yielding ROE business. But when there's a credit environment that we're in right now, you know, that is mindful in terms of uh, what to watch in terms of that book and, and how it translates into relative valuation between these banks. So TD would have the highest exposure on cards, uh, not only in Canada, but in the U.S., and National Bank would have the least exposure. So more risk at TD near term in our view because of that. Really interesting because 5% TD relative to National, so it's five times more. You would see a situation, you mentioned that when the economy is not rolling as much, it's kind of the first one to go. So when the economy is healthy, uh, credit card provisions or, or provision losses or credit card losses for the banks are almost zero, I would imagine, right? I know it's they're, not quite zero. But... They're not, not quite zero. Like mortgages would be like almost zero. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure. If like houses, uh, credit card. Did we lose Scott or did we lose me? I'm not sure. I'm going to keep going here. I imagine Scott's going to come back right away here. Scott, you there? I'm back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're good. Yeah. You were saying uh, it's not quite zero. Mortgages are, are closer to zero. Or mortgages would be below one, right? Below mortgages are below one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and credit cards would be what? The impairments on credit cards in healthy economies. It's low single digits, number. low single digits, you know, and in now, recessions, it could be like right now it's kind of in that like four to five, but as we head further into this pandemic and, and we'll see how unemployment and the rest of the indicators shape out, it could get into the high single digits, low double digit range. So TD has got exposure there is what you're getting at. That's right. So a lot of the talk around Canadian banks and you, you mentioned it, they've, they've suffered. They've, they, it's been, it's been pretty bad. There's an expectation in the market that these bank deferral programs, uh, all the deferral programs are going to, you know, at some point we're going to have to pay the piper, right? I imagine mm -hmm. and the banks are going to have to pay the piper. So what's your take on the, the bank deferral programs and what that's going to look like in the next quarter? And maybe the better question is when does that hit? Do you think? 
Yeah, so it's going to start to hit a little bit this upcoming quarter, Rob. So and maybe, upcoming maybe Scott, maybe you could yeah. just go over the what we're talking about when we're saying the deferral programs again. We're talking about deferral on debts and stuff. Yeah, so the government outlined uh, many deferral programs for, we'll just talk about the Canada, Canada, Canadian side, the Canadian bank. So for mortgages, which is the biggest piece of, you know, the total buck, you know, they, they gave they gave their clients up to six months deferrals on their mortgage payments. Uh, so that's the highest duration in terms of deferral programs. The other programs like credit cards, commercial business are up to three months. So it's that latter one, Rob, the up to three months that you could see it show up in this fiscal quarter and in July 31st, as a lot of those expire during this month. So we'll really get a good indication on that piece of the book this quarter. And then when we head into fiscal Q4, which is the bank's year end, we'll get a better visibility on the mortgages. And that's more important to the market than um, and has a more profound material impact on the market than the prior ones. I, I follow the earnings closely. I always have. My, my dad is a big believer that bank earnings are kind of a, an indi- a good indicator of the economy. We've always followed them closely. I actually did a, a bit of a piece here on my show after the last earnings season, just with the sheer amount of impairments that the different banks had put on their books relative to losses, uh, relative to expected losses, let's put them that way, and relative to what the street thought they would put. So what are your thoughts on impairment? I know this is already going back two months, I guess. Uh, what mm-hmm. were your thoughts on Q2 fiscal? So that would be kind of Q1 uh, calendar impairments that the bank put for loan loss provisions. Yeah, so going back to those actual results, Rob, you know the banks reserved more than the act- than actually what the street was expecting and what we were expecting. Uh, you know, I think the total number was about 12 billion between the big six. You know, the street was at about 10. So banks like Royal Bank and National Bank reserved a lot more than expected. So just playing a bit more defense and being a bit more conservative. And if you kind of look back at the last little mini oil crisis, they did the same thing specifically. National Bank actual losses were actually very, very stable. So they're just setting up all these reserves to cover potential losses over the next several, several, several quarters. You know, what's interesting is Bank of Nova Scotia, which is the only bank that has more emerging market exposure. The other big five banks have U.S. exposure. They're the only bank at the time to target a similar provision, a reserve build this coming up, upcoming fiscal Q3. So the U.S. banks just reporting, we get a better indication of what to look for with the Canadian banks that have that U.S. exposure. And our thinking is just looking at the big six that finished reporting just recently is that, you know, those banks with U.S. exposure would have to probably reserve a bit more than what we're expecting right now. So that's what we're thinking, kind of thinking right now heading into the quarter. Do you think there'll be more provisions relative to 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 equity than there was in Canada on the U.S. side? Yeah, so I think there'll have to be a bit more provisioning on, um, on the U.S. books. So TD, for example, would have 35% exposure into the U.S. market. We'd have to take a look at that and BMO would be number two at 30%, mostly on the commercial side. And then RBC would have about 18% exposure. RBC would actually probably incrementally benefit a little bit because capital markets was the one well was was one of the few bright spots of the US banks you know in terms of trading and advisory and banking fees and and half of Royals uh, US business is on the capital market side so so they would benefit a little bit from that and then CIBC at the low end with private bank is, is probably in the high single digit range so not as material for them but 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 I think collectively when you look at it you know I think our reserve provision provisioning right now is a bit too low 